Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. Um, I don't know, did you guys all see that? Did, did John tell you guys about the prayers, that, uh, the little prayer guide that's in the back through Voice of the Martyrs? Uh, wonderful thing. If you want to know what's going on around the world and who is actually li- li- giving their life uh, for the gospel, this is a great little thing to have in your possession. So we have some of these in the back. Uh, I was uh, blessed by Rachel to get one of those put on my desk, so that was good for me uh, this week. Anyway, before we start... I would like you to please pray. Would you please pray with me that the Lord would send his spirit to attend to our time this morning in his word and to show us the beauty of the unity that we have in Christ, the unity of the spirit within the believers. So if you would please just take a moment right now just to pray that God would send his spirit to us right now. And Jeff, can you turn me down on the monitors? It's like going, whoa, whoa, whoa. Can you turn me down on the monitors? If I go like this, I bet you you're going to go and hear a big boom. Anyway, would you please pray right now, just quietly where you're at, for the Lord to send his spirit to attend to our time. Father God, I thank you for this glorious time. We, Lord, desire to see in your word the greatness of Christ. Lord, show us Christ this morning. Show us the fullness of his faithfulness and all that we see uh, this morning, Father, that we're brought near to you. We're brought near through the blood of your Son. May it be, Father, that we are thoughtful of that this day, that we have been taken out of the domain of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of your beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. May we focus upon that this morning, Father, the greatness of what you have done. Lord, how you've removed us from these things, Lord, that would assail us, Lord, that we would sit in darkness and in fear. Lord, we thank you that the fear has been dispelled, that uh, Christ has destroyed the works of Satan, that he has come. And Lord, now we look forward with great hope, Lord, that we are in Christ, Lord, to the return of Christ. And so I ask, Father, this morning that you would bless my heart and my mind, Lord, that I might be a servant of Christ and a steward of your mysteries, and that your people's hearts, Father, would be open this morning to receive your word, Father, to have it richly dwell within them and to be on their hearts, their minds, and their tongues, Lord, to speak and to be a witness of what you have done that now we live in Christ, Lord. We have been crucified with him. It is no longer we who live, but Christ lives in us. What a thing for us to fathom this morning, Father, that in our union with Christ, he's living through us. So please, Father, bless the time now. May it be that we are glorifying you as we exalt Christ, empowered by your spirit. So please send your spirit to do so, Father. Please set our sins aside. Forgive us our sin this morning, Father, that we might come to you clearly with open heart and mind, Lord, to hear you and to be changed. So please bless the time, Father, for your glory and for our good. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We went through uh, sections 1 through 10, and now we're in a transition with a therefore. Of course, the therefore part passes us back up into 1 through 10. So this morning, what I'd like to do is just briefly go back and do a little review, just going back through verses 1 through 10 before we move into 11. 11 through 22 is another section, so you can really divide this chapter into two sections. And now he's talking about unity. He's really starting to introduce to us the unity of the church. How many of us have heard unity in the last year? (laughs) Anybody getting tired of the unity thing, right? Now, let's just remove your thoughts of that from the political, okay, please, and put it into the spiritual, because that's what Paul is talking about this morning. Paul is talking about the unity of the spirituality of the church, all right? So we get this unity out there in 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 the world. We get this secular, political, all this other unity being thrown at us all the time. And so we can become numb to what God wants us to understand about the unity of his church, the unity of the Christian church, the unity that we have in Christ. And it's a unity based upon the spirit indwelling us. You just glance over, you see that in verse, or in uh, verses one through six of chapter four. That's what he says is the unity that comprises us. We don't, we're not unified around doctrine. We're not unified around these other secondary issues. We're unified around the gospel. Okay, we need to understand that we can fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ because they have the gospel. They know the gospel and they live out the gospel. Okay, that's what unifies us. The spirit dwelling within us, making us to understand the gospel, making us to be born again. All right. We are born again. I mean, you guys, any of you guys been watching the chosen, the series, the chosen? So you should watch. It's pretty good. You know, it's, I like it. It's pretty good. We binge watched it. So I don't know if you guys are into binge watching, but uh, there's some beautiful things in there. Some beautiful things. But there are some, you know, I'm sure somebody's going to come up with some controversial things. But 
that whole idea of being born again when he's talking to Nicodemus and he gives him a big hug. And I'm like, that doesn't, that's not in the scriptures, but you know, Nicodemus does come to understand the truth of being born again and it's through the spirit dwelling within him. But where were we before that? Now, this starts out with Paul coming to this end, the end of our section here. He says, but now, that's reminiscent of but God. What has God been doing? What is God at work doing within his people? Back up to verse one. In chapter two of verse one, it says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. So there's an element of obedience to the gospel too. We understood this from the last couple times we were here. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So I want to stop right there. Verse three, even as the rest. It's a universal condemnation. Paul right now, he's going to go into this issue that the church is having of division between the Gentiles and the Jews. And he goes, this shouldn't happen because remember, universally we were all dead. The Jews and the Gentiles, every person was universally dead without Christ. So we have to understand that part of the unity that we have is we're saved together. There's no difference. There's no free, no slave, no Jew, no Greek, no Scythian, no barbarian, right? At this time, Jews and Gentiles did not look favorably upon each other. The Greeks, of course, thought they were the best, right? Everything to the gods was written in Greek, right? If you look at some of the philosophers and the things that are addressed in the Greek culture of the time, Paul is is breaking away at that. He's breaking those things down. The things of the world, he's doing away with. He's taking them away. But it's a universal statement. Everybody is dead in their sins and trespasses. Everybody, the Jew and the Gentile. Because some people would look at this and they would say, hey, is Paul coming down hard on the Gentiles here and lifting the Jews up? No, he's trying to get the Jews and the Gentiles to realize neither one of them have a standing before God. None of us do. Do we walk around sometimes saying, I'm a believer, I'm in the church, I'm a Christian, look at me. Do we sometimes think God has shown his favor on me and now I'm proud of that? Or do we walk around going, wow, look what God has done in my life. Look how God has taken me out of darkness. The domain of darkness, that domain that I talked about there in 1 Corinthians 1, 14 and 15, is a, uh, 13 and 14, is an authority. You've been taken out from under the authority of darkness and evil. Think about this for a minute. God has taken you out from that. That used to dominate you. That used to rule over you. And now you're in the kingdom of his beloved son in whom you have redemption, the forgiveness of your sins. Your sins have been paid for. They've been taken away But he didn't leave you there because he put you in the kingdom of his beloved son. He also gave you his righteousness. He gave you the inheritance. And Paul's trying to get the, the, the Ephesians to realize the magnitude. Paul wants the Ephesians to realize the magnitude of what God has done in their lives. So you first had to see in in chapter two that the the wrath was upon them, that they were under this, even as the rest. It was universal. But God being rich in mercy. Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ. The already not yet. Already we have this, but not in its fullness yet. Seven. So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us, in Christ Jesus, that we are to be a testimony of what Christ has done, just like the Israelites were to be. What were the Israelites called to be? A witness to the nations. In the Old Testament, Paul's Paul's basically saying to us, have you not rightly understood the Old Testament? Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones brought this to my attention. What Paul is trying to get these Gentiles and Jews to understand is reading the Old Testament helps us to see the work of Christ. In the Old Testament, these are the things that were coming forward that they needed to look to, the work of Christ, their common fellowship, the blessings that God was putting upon them, whether they were Jew or Gentile, slave or free, Scythian or barbarian, it doesn't matter. Or in my case, Finnish. Anybody Finnish here? I'm not Irish, just so you guys know. Nothing to say bad about the Irish. I'm Finnish. Is that okay? Everybody okay with that? Everybody's like, yeah, okay, whatever. There should be no reason why we look at anyone that way. Um, down in Stockton right now, there's a church that has got 10 people that have come to the Lord. Most of them came out of prison and they're being baptized. About six of them have been baptized. So there's a little uh, pensiveness, right? You've got these prisoners who just came out of prison who just became saved. 
Now, the pandemic is, is a result of this because people are fearing the pandemic, and so these people have been saved. But there's this, this, this little bit of tension in the church down there. I was talking to my mother-in-law this morning. A little bit of tension. It's like, these guys came out of prison. These guys came out of a prison system. How do we welcome them in? How do we understand who they are in Christ? How do we, how do we welcome them into the unity of the, of the brotherhood? Well, there are consequences, Right? If I was in prison for a crime, there's consequences for that. David understood this. When David committed adultery with Bathsheba, what was the consequence? He lost that son, right? There are consequences. So there's consequences that don't, should not interrupt our unity with one another. I've done bad things. You've done bad things. Anybody out, just got out of prison here in the room? Set for no, sir. No. But the unity, we should be welcoming our brothers and sisters. If there's a profession of Christ, the gospel should overshadow those things. There are consequences, but the shadowing of those things. And this is the surpassing riches of the grace and kindness towards us in Christ, being in Christ. Christ was gracious to those prisoners. Christ was gracious to prisoners who had been in prison and they came out and they saw the truth of the gospel. God gave them new birth and now by his grace they have been saved through faith. Verse eight. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. It's God's gift. It's God's working. He worked it out. He was faithful. In the Old Testament, they saw them as faithful. God was never unfaithful to the Jews in the Old Testament. He was always faithful to them. What was the issue? Their unfaithfulness. That's something we always need to realize. In the Old Testament, God is not unfaithful. The Jewish people were unfaithful to the covenant which God made to them. And it was God's promise to them. It wasn't a contract. It was a covenant. Verse 9. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship. Isn't that as beautiful? We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. The works come after our salvation. We're saved to do something. We don't do something to be saved. Okay? Again, the illustration. We never see a horse pushing a cart. He pulls it. Perfect example. So he says, therefore... Okay, so now we come into a transition. So that's before us. We have this this beautiful picture of being in Christ, our union with Christ. Whenever you doubt your salvation, think about it. Am I in union with Christ? Do I know that it's through his death, burial, and resurrection, his ascension? Am I one with him because God has revealed my sin to me and I know I need to repent of my sin and I know I need to trust in Christ, put my faith in him, right? Because he was faithful. My faith is in Christ that he gave to me. That's God's gift. It's God's possession. It's God's working, And I'm his workmanship. Therefore, I'm his workmanship. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called the uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Boom. Sounds like he's really coming down on the Gentiles there, doesn't it? Sure does. Looks like he's really taking a stand in the church against the Gentiles, saying, you Gentiles. But look at the way this is phrased. He's actually in some, now some people have a hard time when I say that Paul is being a little sarcastic. He's throwing a little something at them there. Look at the fact that he says, so-called circumcision. The so-called circumcision. He's saying, the Jews, are the Jews looking down on the Gentiles? Are the Jews thinking that they have better standing with God because they're Jewish Christians? Paul's saying, no, no, there's a unity here. There's a beautiful unity in the church. But he says, therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision. Paul is making a clear delineation between that fact. And he wants us to know that he wants this, this church to be unified universally we're dead in our sins and trespasses, universally we're saved by faith in Christ, just like in the Old Testament. But even says, which was performed in the flesh by human hands. What a thing for him to put before them, human hands. A quote I have from, uh, from the Cross of Peace by Sir Philip Gibbs. John MacArthur has this in his commentary, and I thought this was good for us to realize with what we're looking at right now universally. Okay, when we talk about this unity right now in the secular world, we're looking at our nation, but are we looking at the world? This is a good quote from uh, The Cross of Peace by Sir Philip Gibbs. He writes this. The problem of fences has grown to be one of most acute that the world must face. Today, there are all sorts of zigzag and crisscrossing fences running through the races and peoples of the world. Modern progress has made the world a neighborhood. And God has given us the task of making it a 
brotherhood. A brotherhood. In these days of dividing walls of race and class, we must shake the earth anew with the message of Christ, in whom there is neither bond nor free, Jew nor Greek, Scythian nor barbarian, but all are one. Would you agree with that statement? Do we need to shake our neighborhoods? Do we need to shake the earth with the gospel? Isn't that what the apostles did? Isn't that what they did? You're stirring up the entire world with this teaching. Yes, the gospel should stir up the entire world. It should stir up these things. It should break down those fences. We don't worry about a neighborhood. We worry about a brotherhood. We need to shake the world with the message of Jesus Christ. And it needs to be proliferant in our minds and our hearts and our minds. But the truth is actually tragically different. The same letter, in the same letter to the Corinthians, in which Paul so strongly declared the positional unity of believers, he also strongly rebuked the Corinthians for their practical disunity. Here you have a group of believers, the Corinthians, right? You could call them the Californians, right? The Corinthian church, right, is sitting there. And he's basically telling them beautifully who they are in the first chapter. He goes to length of telling them who they are. But then he also says, there are some issues that you guys have. There's some issues of disunity. So he's talking to a group of believers. So turn with me to 1 Corinthians. Let's look at chapter 1. I mean, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This first eight verses there. I just want to take a look at this. Because I want to say, there's some of this going on today in our churches. But how is it going on? Uh, Somebody asked me one time, is this basically where denominations started? Somebody asked me one time about chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, said, isn't that where denominations came about? And I said, no, 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 no. The church was one up until the Reformation. After the Reformation, we see denominational differences. In our day today, how many denominations, can anybody mention how many denominations they know of around the world or even, okay, just in California maybe, okay? I actually was sitting in the public library one time and I saw a book up on the shelf and it, it, it intrigued me because I looked at it and I went, denominations. And I went, oh my, being the analytical person that I was, I need to read this book. It's about that thick. And I'm thinking, there's only three denominations. No, I'm just kidding, that was a joke. But there's that book, and I'm like, what is this book about deno- Protestant denominations? So I pulled it off the shelf. Every page was another denomination. It had over 400 pages in this book. And I flip a page after a page. It had a little brief outline of these different denominations. You know, Eastern Baptist, Southern Baptist, Four Baptist, Baptist, and then you go through it. It's just like after one, after another, after another. After, I'm just like, holy cow. How many denominations could there be? And what's the differences? And you start reading through some of the differences of this thing, right? You're like, okay, these guys split over Oh, wow, that's kind of strange, you know. I'm not going to bore you with the details, but as you look at the, the reasons why they started splitting, it's like, wow, those are secondary and even tertiary issues that they're separating over. But are they unified on the gospel? Are they unified on the gospel? And this basically happens after the Reformation. After the 16th century, you see denominations coming about for good reasons and for bad reasons. There are some good reasons for us to have doctrinal distinctives in the church. So there are some things, but are they gospel central and focused? But look at what he says here in 1 Corinthians 3. And again, this was something that was brought to my attention as I was doing uh, table talk. If you guys haven't been doing table talk, they're back in Corinthians again, 1 Corinthians, a wonderful study. And this is what I studied on the 29th and the 30th actually came out of this study. So just, it's a good study. Um, And I want to just read to you this. It says, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh and as to infants in Christ. So he's referring to these guys as immature. He's saying, hey, you are infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not able to receive it. Indeed, even now, you are not able to, to, not able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? So is there jealousy and strife among them? Are you not walking like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, or another, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? What then is Apollos, and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. Underline that. God was causing the growth. Each of us have a gift to exercise within the church. None is greater than another gift. All gifts are the same. We're one body with one head. We exercise our gifts, he says. But here, there are one. Verse seven. 
So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. God is the one who causes the growth. We do our work that he's assigned to us, but God causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. Paul was one who built the foundation. Was Paul more important in the church? He would say no. He said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. God gave me this to do. Paul would not come in here and say, I'm an apostle. He uses his authority only when it's necessary, only when he's doing something that is necessary for the church. He doesn't think of himself as someone who should be of prominence. He says, I'm a servant. I'm a slave. It's a do loss. He actually calls himself a slave of Christ. He's bought and paid for by Christ. Paul is humble in his regard to his position. We would see Paul and we'd say, Paul, you've got the pulpit. If Paul walked in here right now, say, it's your pulpit, dude. He'd say, feed me. He'd probably sit down and say, preach Christ to me, right? Paul says he's nothing. Apollos is nothing. He is nothing. One plants, one waters, but God causes the growth. What's the focus? God. But God. What has God done? What did God do? What did God do through the faithfulness of Christ? Last week we talked about that, right? We put our faith in Christ, but it's the substance of what he's done. Have you done anything to save yourself? Well, yeah, I mean, I was good today. No, God did it. God caused the growth. Somebody put a seed in you. Somebody else watered it. Rick McGinty put some seeds in my life. Somebody else watered it. Somebody else got the growth though. Rick McGinty was my professor. If you guys remember, Rick McGinty used to stand in this pulpit right here. He was one of my first pastors when I came here. At my, my, uh, sorry, sorry. I have a brain fade there. I'm getting old today. Um, At the seminary where I was at, I wasn't a believer. I was 20 years old. My first son was just born. I'm 20 years old. I don't know anything but to fear God. I don't know that Christ is my savior. In the last hour of instruction, Rick is standing up in front of the class. He says, I'm done. He goes, I'm done. You can all just leave if you want. I've got one hour left. So Rick is standing there. He goes, I got one hour left. You can leave if you want, but I've got something to say to you. Nobody left the room. And he says, the bulletproof vest and the gun on your hip won't save you from dying someday and facing God in heaven. And you'll have to give an account of everything you've done, right and wrong, right? Everything you've done. What am I building on? You know, the foundation. So Rick stands there and he tells me, he plants a seed. He plants a seed in my life that I needed a savior. The bulletproof vest. And we were doing really good too. We were out running around in the dark with shotguns and everything else. And we, we thought we were, you know, gonna save the world being law enforcement. And Rick basically took us and just whapped our knees out from underneath us and said, you need a savior. So he planted a seed. I wasn't a believer at that point. Not until a Texan walked into my house and presented the gospel to me. Then that seed came to fruition. Some plant, some water. What are you guys doing? How many of you are planting seeds? Anybody plant seeds out there? Anybody watering? You know, what are we doing? What are we doing with the gospel? What are we doing with the gospel? What would Paul have us to be doing with the gospel? What's our unity? What is the unity? We're unified around the gospel. Unified with the brother, our brothers and sisters in Christ with the gospel. Back to Ephesians. Back to Ephesians. In Corinth, there was some divisions there. There were some divisions that were happening and Paul is trying to correct them and saying, you need to have the unity of the spirit. The disunity of the Ephesians church was primarily between the Jews and the Gentile believers. But this passage just focuses on the idea of the spiritual oneness that they have, the spiritual oneness. God sovereignly chose the Jews to be his special people. The only ones that he chose among all the families of the earth, in Amos 3.2, he says the only ones that he chose was them. God chose the Jews not only to receive a special blessing, but also to be a channel of those blessings to others. Are we being a channel of those blessings? See, Paul is kind of looking back in the Old Testament right now. He's saying, have you understood what the Israelites were all about? They were a channel of the blessings of God. They were to bring things to people's attention. They were to be a people set aside, set apart for God, for a witness. All the families of the earth shall be blessed. Who was that spoken to? All the families of the earth. Genesis 12, 3. Abraham received a blessing before there were Jews and Gentiles. Abraham was blessed to be a blessing. Abraham was blessed to be a blessing. 
Are we a conduit of that? Are we a channel of that? Israel was called to be a vessel through which the knowledge of God would be spread to the entire world. The church is now following that model, following that example. We don't replace Israel, but we follow the model of what Israel was to do. Again, Paul is trying to focus their attention on this. Again, he's, he's bringing something to light here. He's saying the so-called circumcision is looking down on this uncircumcised. And that should never be the issue, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. It's of no value whatsoever. So remember in verse 12, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. Five things in verse 12 we need to look at. The first thing we looked at is this issue of a social alienation. They were socially alienated through the Gentiles and the Jews and through the Scythians and the barbarians and the Greeks. There was a social alienation that was going on and he wanted to draw attention to in verse 11. Verse 12, he's saying, now we need to talk about these other issues. These other issues of the spiritual alienation. There's five of them in this text. Now, here's the thing. He's gonna say, you're alienated from these things, but now, he says, now you're not. So we need to look at the negative to understand the positive. Do you guys like the positive or the negative? How many of you like negatives? How many of you guys like contrasts? You guys like to look at things in a contrast? You can see things very clearly when you contrast them, can't you? Paul is doing that for us right here. Paul is gonna say, here's the things that they were alienated from. Here's the things that they didn't have. Everybody didn't have these things. The Jews, the Gentiles, everybody didn't have these things. And now we need to look at them. As he says, remember this. He says, remember that you were at that time so Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones says he's referring to a point that no one was there. No Jew or Gentile in like manner was there. And we need to read the Old Testament with a picture of Christ in the Old Testament. Did Jesus echo that? Road to Emmaus in Luke 24, Jesus says the very same thing. He says the Old Testament, all the prophets and apostles and the writings are about me. It would have been great if he would have went through the whole Old Testament and shown us that. But Jesus would concur with that thought. That in Luke 24, on the road to Emmaus, he tells those disciples that everything is about him. So he now says, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ. Wow, separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promises, having no hope and without God in the world. That's a thing for us to just fathom right there, what we have in this regard. So first of all, they were Christless, separated from Christ, the Messiah. If you've noticed multiple times, Paul keeps telling them with Christ, in Christ, in union with Christ. The beauty of this is that we're in union with Christ. They, were, they therefore had no messianic hope of a savior or a deliverer. Their history had no purpose, no plan, no destiny, except the ultimate judgment of God of which they were unaware. They were unaware of it. They had no, they were separate from Christ. They had no union with Christ. Now, if you here this morning know the gospel, you're in union with Christ. Can anybody here tell me how you were saved? Can anybody tell me what the gospel is? Is the gospel complex? Really quick question. Is the gospel complex? If I were to ask you to give me, and I have my new Fitbit watch on, if I were to ask you to tell me the gospel in 30 seconds, could you do it? 30 seconds, you got that. Everybody, yeah, can you do it? 30 seconds, I should hear the gospel. Boom, like that, right? I'm not talking for, about a doctrinal dissertation. I'm just saying 30 seconds, you should be able to think about the gospel and articulate it. I was dead in my sins and trespasses and now I'm alive in Christ. But they were separate from Christ. All the pagan deities that they were worshiping in Ephesus, Artemis, who was it there? Diana or Artemis, hideous beasts that required uh, things to come upon them. They were wicked and capricious rather than holy and faithful. Look at the contrast in Ephesus. As Paul is looking at these Ephesians, he's saying, look at the contrast around you. Look at the, the things of the world around you. Artemis, Right there, evil, evil. And you've got to do something to appease this wicked and capricious God. Compare that to Christ. Compare that to the God of the Old Testament who is holy and faithful. He is faithful. Compare the two things. And look at that. They were without Christ. Those who didn't believe God in the Old Testament were without Christ. Abraham longed to see the day of Christ, Jesus told them in John 5. Longed to see him and he saw his day. He saw that day. So they were separated from Christ. The first thing he wants to say, they were separate from Christ. Universally separated from Christ. Jews and Gentiles were separated from Christ. He's gonna flip that for us because we're gonna be in Christ. Let's keep looking here. He says, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. 
excluded from the benefits of being one in Israel. What did Israel have? What was the land like? A land flowing with milk and honey. Well, what's that like? So the milk and honey just comes out of the ground? No, it was a prosperous land. It still is today. You know that, that most of Israel has the same topography and climate as California? Is that interesting? I found that interesting when I found that out. I'm like, wait a minute. That is pretty much, and you see the mountain range there. If you look at California and you look at Israel, they have very similar topographies and blessings. So when we talk about the commonwealth, it's the land and the fruit of the land that they had. They were a blessed people. They were taken into the land of Canaan. They were taken into a land of promise, flowing with milk and honey. Isn't California like that? We have it all. We have everything. We, we export stuff to the entire world as long as we can get the water to water it. So there's this commonwealth, but they were separated from that. They weren't having those benefits. But there's a commonwealth that Israel had. They were blessed in these things. They were spiritually alienated because they were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. The special blessings, the special protections, and the love of God. There's a little section I want to give you for homework. I don't have time to read it right now, but in Ezekiel 16, verses 4 through 14, he talks about Israel as being like a child that didn't have its cord cut, was just cast out into the wilderness, cast out into a field. And what did God do for Israel? What did God do for Israel? It says, then I bathed you with water. I washed off your blood from you and anointed you with oil. I also clothed you with embroidered cloth and put sandals and a porpoise skin on your feet. And I wrapped you with fine linen and covered you with silk. And I adorned you with ornaments, put bracelets on your hands and a necklace around your neck. I also put a ring in your nostril. You don't need that. That's okay. Some, wait, anybody? never mind. Only the girls. Earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver and your dress was of fine linen, silk and embroidered cloth. You are fine. You are, you ate fine flour, honey and oil so that you exceedingly beautiful and advanced in royalty. Then your fame went forth among the nations on account of your beauty. For it was perfect because of my splendor, which I bestowed on you. See that? You were beautiful because God put his splendor and his, he bestowed upon you his perfect, his perfection, his splendor which he bestowed on you, declares the Lord God. Verse 14 of Ezekiel 16. You were what you were because I made you look good. That's what he's telling, telling them. But he took them out of the field. They were, they were basically cast out, squirming in their blood. No cord cut yet, but he went and took care of them. He gave them a land flowing with milk and honey. That's what it means to have that common wealth of Israel, that you had this blessing, that they were alienated from it. But now we have this, this, this prosperity. God watches over us. Anybody in need this morning? Anybody need a meal this morning? Did everybody eat breakfast this morning? I had fig bars in my office because I forgot to eat before I got here. It's okay, we got snacks in the kitchen. If anybody needs food, we got it, right? We are cared for. We're well, we are well cared for because we're in Christ, more so that we're in Christ. We're grateful because we're in Christ. We understand this is commonwealth of Israel, but they were alienated from it and strangers to the covenants of promise. Angel, or strangers to the covenants of promise. The third thing I want you to notice there is the Gentiles were spiritually alienated because they were without a covenant with God. Strangers to the covenants of promise. The supreme covenant of promise was the one given to who? Abraham. Abraham. Genesis 12. Again, quoted in 15 and 17. Throughout Genesis, the first section there. says, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And of the one who curses you, I will curse. We want to make sure we're good friends with Israel, right? We want to make sure that we are blessing them. They're a blessing to the earth. But how many times have people come up against them? Time and time again. But the blessing is to Abraham. And in Romans 4, Paul's going to make the case. This blessing came to Abraham before what? Before circumcision, before the law, before you thought you could do it on your own. The blessing came upon Abraham. Nothing that Abraham did. Inherent within the one great covenant were the Mosaic, the Palestinian, and the Davidic covenants, and even the new covenant. Remember, we've talked about this. Jeremiah 31, 33, the new covenant that he talks about is to an old covenant people. The new covenant naturally comes out of the old covenant. The new covenant doesn't delete the old covenant. It fulfills it. The new covenant that Christ fulfilled is a fulfillment of what was required. Think about that for a second. What was required? Perfection. Who did that? 
Who's, who did the law perfectly? Anybody here? Should have maybe one or two people who have since birth have completed the law. Anybody? There should be at least two of you here. There's zero. That's good. Everybody knows that you can't do it. So we've covered total depravity. Who could do it? Christ. Who is the, who is the blessing to? Abraham. All the way back in the Old Testament, the blessing was to Abraham before Christ was even there. How could this be? Abraham looked for Christ and he saw his day and rejoiced. In the Old Testament, there was a pictures of Christ. In the Old Testament was pictures of God's grace and mercy. Hosea says, I don't require sacrifice. What does Hosea say? He says, I require a heart that is before me, the compassion and mercy, that we exemplify God's mercy. So they were alien, they were strangers to these covenants of promise. We're not. So you flip all of these back over, we're not. We get that. We have a covenant with God. We're in that covenant with Abraham. We're sons of him through faith in Christ. We're sons of with Abraham. We get those blessings. Not now, but then later on. We're well cared for here, but someday we'll see the blessings of Abraham in fullness. Having no hope. Wow. What is it like to have no hope? Look around you in the world. What's it like to have no hope? How many of you have hope this morning? How many of you are trusting in a savior to return and gather you up and you live? Uh, everybody's supposed to raise your hand. So on the other one, nobody. Now everybody raises their hand. If you don't, I'm going to evangelize on the way out the door. Where's our hope? Where's our hope? They were, they were alienated, right? Alien strangers without hope. That's what you see in the world right now. You've got the beautiful picture of walking out of here and saying, I got hope. Get the t-shirt. The t-shirt, by the way, is gonna say, but God, and on the back it'll say, but now. And so you tell them, but God did this, and now I'm like this. We gotta get some t-shirts. Fourthly, let's look about this fourthly. Alienated, they're with hopeless, having no hope. Those who have no Christ, no commonwealth, no covenants of promise, also have no hope. True hope can be based only on true promise. Only true hope can be based on true promise, God's promises and his faithfulness. Last week I made that nuance. I said, we are banking on the faithfulness of who? God in Christ. We're banking on him being faithful. Everything that he has said he would do, he did. Are you banking on that this morning? When somebody asks you what the gospel is, it's like, Christ, his faithfulness. I'm banking on his faithfulness. I'm banking on what he did. I got nothing. He's got it all. And God put me in union with him. Took me out of that. Took me out of the field that Ezekiel said. Took my umbilical cord off. Cleaned me up. Clothed me. Salted me. Washed me. Gave me shoes and a, and a crown. He made his beauty to be my beauty. We are beautiful because of Christ. We don't have to worry about self-esteem. The world around you wants to say, hey, look within your side yourself. Your value is inside yourself. No, show them that it's Christ adorning you. Just like in Ezekiel 7, 16, 4 through 14. He says, your splendor is the splendor which I bestowed on you. Is the Old Testament and the New Testament the same in that regard? Yes, the beauty you have, the worth that you have is because you're in Christ and he adorns you. When people look at you and you say, what value do you have? Only the value that Christ has given me. Only the value that his righteousness is on me. My account's been emptied of my sin. His righteousness is on me. I am now splendid. Now, how many of you would say today I look splendid? Okay, nobody, thanks. That's humbling. Wow, I don't look splendid. But it's Christ. It's Christ. The hope that we have is in Christ. The hope of Israel Acts, Acts 28, 20, Paul would talk about the hope of Israel. The hope of Israel is in Christ. He's saying that that's come. He's telling the Jewish community, your hope is the same hope of everyone else. It's universal. Hope is a profound blessing that gives meaning and security to life. Living without hope of future joy and enrichment reduces man to a piece of meaningless protoplasm. You guys want me to say that again? How many scientists in the room? What's protoplasm? It's just a mass of cells, right? Think about it. Why does the abortion movement have such a movement? Because it's just a mass of cells. I don't have one of my pins on today. I usually carry a little pin on my lapel of a little pair of feet. It would have been legally, uh, you would have the legal right to abort that, that, those little feet that I carry right there. They're no bigger than my thumb, but you can look at those little feet and you can see feet. You can see human life. It's not a mass of cells. But if you have no hope, 
you only see yourself as a mass of protoplasm. You see no hope. You have no hope because you are nothing but, as John MacArthur puts it, a protoplasm. Wow, where is our, that's if you look inside yourself. Don't look inside yourself. Look to Christ. Look to Christ. Our hope is in Christ, his faithfulness, what he has done. They were without hope in this world and without God. Israel was able to have complete hope in God's promises because he had every resource at his disposal and because he cannot lie. God cannot lie. God cannot lie to us. Everything he says he will do, he will do. He is faithful. We bank on that. Strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Fifth and most importantly, the Gentiles were spiritually alienated because they were without God in the world. You guys remember in Acts 17, Paul is on Mars Hill and they had all these temples to all these gods and he went out there and he looked at them all. What did they have just in case they messed up and they missed a God that they needed to recognize? The temple to the unknown God in Acts 17, 22 and 23 says, I want to tell you guys about that unknown God you got out there. The one you thought you needed to have something with. How many of you have ever encountered people who just want to add Christ to everything else that they've got going on? I've met people like that. I've met people who who worship the pantheon gods and they just came here and they said, hey, I want to get baptized. You want to get baptized? Cool. Yeah, I've been worshiping the pantheon gods. I heard about Christ. I just want to add them to, oh, time out. (laughs) Sorry, Uh, there's an exclusivity with Christ. He is the only God. Well, can I just add them there? No. Well, I practiced. No, you can't practice that anymore. You've got to change. Well, what about this? I said, no. I said, we'll help you. But you've got to get rid of your old life. The individual did not want to get rid of their old life, did not want to get rid of their old gods, did not want to get rid of everything because I said Christ has to be exclusive to that individual. They felt condemned. They left. They went, sorry about that, but I was presenting the gospel to you. It would have either brought conviction to salvation or condemnation to death. Sad moment for me, but I couldn't change the truth of the gospel just to appease someone who wanted to add them to everything else they were doing. Without God in the world, they turned to the world. That's a reality. Not every time you present the gospel to somebody does it turn out good. Sometimes they choose the world. Without God in the world, but now. Everybody underline that, please. That's your but God. That's your but now. That's your t-shirt. But now. But now. But now. But now. Right this very minute. Right this very minute. Anyone who doesn't know Christ, oh, that you would consider who Christ is. Oh, right now you would consider the debt before a holy and righteous God. That you would not fall into the hands of the living God. That you would not have to face God and pay for your sins because you will not be able to. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift. But the free gift. Oh, don't you love the conjunction but? But the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That was a term for Gentiles, for the Jews. They were those who were far away. The Gentiles were a group of people known as those who were far away, far off. The Gentiles were far off, but the people of God all were near. He's playing on the fact that he's looking to the Old Testament. He's looking there and he's correcting the Jews right now. He's correcting them. He says, guys, they're brought near. The promises were for every nation, for every tribe, tongue, nation, and people group. Should we be concerned about missions? Yeah, because the gospel goes out to every tribe, nation, people group all over the planet. Remember I've quoted Mark 16, 15, where we're supposed to go out and proclaim the gospel to who? All of creation, all of the created order, everything. I'm not saying you evangelize your cat like I do, but we're supposed to preach to everything in the created order, everything out there, everything out there, every aspect of the creation is a testimony of God because we are with God. So just flip all those over now. Let's just go back up there. Go back up with me, please. What were they separated from? From Christ. Are you separated from Christ? No, you're in Christ. They were once formerly that, but now you are in Christ. 
Are you excluded from the commonwealth of Israel? No, you've been blessed as Abraham is blessed. Blessed to be a blessing. In whatever measure you've been blessed, you've been blessed to be a blessing, just like Abraham. Are you strangers of the covenants of promise? No, we see the covenants of promise. We see what God promised to his people, his people, his chosen people. We see that he has promised them an abundance. Having no hope, you have hope. Now you have hope. You have hope in Christ. You have hope in his return. You have hope in the fact that he did the work for you. And without God in the world, you've got God and you're here in the world. All I want to know amongst you is Christ and him crucified, he told the Corinthians. All I want to know amongst you is Christ and him crucified. You have Christ. You are not without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are formerly far off, you who are Gentiles, who have another race, you've now been brought near by the blood of Christ. You've now been embraced by God through the blood of his son. Because in Christ, the great foundational barrier of sin has been removed. I'm going to quote, quote John MacArthur here, this last little section. This is John MacArthur's quote. Because in Christ, the great foundational barrier of sin has been removed. Every other barrier has been removed as well. Those who are one in Christ are one in each other. One in Christ means we're one in what? Each other. We're unified because we're in Christ. If you're in Christ, you're unified with all those who are in Christ, all those who profess the gospel. Whether they realize it or act like it or not, the purpose of the Lord's table is to remind us of the sacrifice of our Lord made not only to bring us to himself, but also to bring us to each other. We're to be one. We're to be unified. By removing our sin, Christ gives us peace with each other and access to God. Is that not comforting? You have access to God. Through the high priesthood of Christ, as the author of Hebrews would say, you can now come confidently to the throne of God in time of need. Do we just come when we have a need? Do you guys only come to God when you have a need? Is he just something you come to when you need something? When things are going good, you should be asking, oh, what's going to happen that's going to take that away? We should be thankful, right? Every morning, you just say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you that you put me in Christ. Thank you that I'm no longer excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, stranger to your covenants, having no hope and without God in the world. Thank you, God, that those things have been removed. Everyone was alienated from God. Everyone was that way, not just Jews and Gentiles. He's saying be unified because you're in Christ. Be unified because now you have a hope. Be unified. You have been brought near, embraced because of the blood of Christ, embraced because of what he has done for you. So what are we banking on? We're banking on what Christ did for us. He brought us near. Let's pray.